Extension Podcast. I'm Bob Birch. Great to have you along for uh, today's podcast as we uh, welcome to the show Kelsey Romney. Uh, Kelsey is a program coordinator with U Utah State University uh, 4-H youth programs and uh, we're going to talk to her today about kind of an interesting project that she has going on using web conferencing uh, for uh, some summits led by 4-H uh, youth leaders. Uh, Kelsey, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Um, so the, let's learn a little bit more about you. How, how long have you been with uh, Utah State University 4-H? Um, so I actually grew up in the 4-H program, so I've always been pretty familiar with 4-H, but I grew up in the horse project, so I didn't really know everything that 4-H could offer. Um, when I graduated college at Utah State with my bachelor's degree, I uh, applied for an assistant position, a program assistant position in the state 4-H office, and I worked in that position for about two years. And then um, as of January, I was uh, moved into the coordinator position uh, here in this in the same office. So I've been really fortunate to get to know the program a lot more as an assistant and now um, be able to use some of those skills as a coordinator. So do you work a lot with sort of the horse program end of it since that is your is your background? Um, you know, I still do uh, quite a bit with the horse program, but that's just because it's kind of my passion and something I'm interested in. Um, my position is actually over more of the events and activities across the state. So we do a lot of leadership activities. We do a lot of youth camps. Um, that I, I'm over the officer program. Um, so the horse, pro the horse project area is just one very small portion of what I do here in the office. So can you tell us a little bit more about these summits that you're using the web conferencing to put on? Uh, we'll talk more about the web conferencing in, but what, what really are the summits? What's their purpose? And Yeah, so um, we have, like I said, I'm over the state officer program, and it's a fairly new program. We've had an ambassador program, which is um, eight youth leaders that we use to help um, throughout the state with events and camps, and um, they really serve as the ambassadors for the, for the program. The state officers is fairly new. I think we're on our third year here. And um, there's only four state officers and they serve each of 4-H's mission mandates, which is science, citizenship and healthy living. And then we have one officer who is our president and he serves more of a leadership position. And so um, they're elected by their peers at uh, one of our big events in the summer called state contests. And then after they've been elected, they go to their own trainings for each of their mission mandates. Um, they also go, also go to national 4-H conference and they learn about um, round table topics that are kind of hot topics for youth to be learning about across the nation. And so they get to really collaborate with a bunch of people. And we were trying to um, find a way to reach our county youth. So in across the state, um, with this national information that our officers have learned. Um, in 4-H, we know that youth teaching youth is probably the best method to get something across and learn by doing. So um, we try to provide experiences that people can learn from by actually participating in something interactive. And so um, the last couple of years, we've done summits in person, but we have a lot of state events that go on. And so it's hard for people to attend every single one of these events and um, it's also costly you know we we try to keep things very low and compared to what our you know quote unquote competitors offer in youth development we're really really low because we're nonprofit. but um it's also still you know things still cost money and so these youth that are trying to save up to come to these state events just don't have an extra hundred dollars or whatever it takes to come to these so uh, this year, we started doing the summits via Zoom, um, so we'd meet virtually, and we'd play an interactive game that the kids could be playing from their county, and we would provide uh, like workshop foods to the, each of their county offices that we had delivered. So it cut our costs down quite a bit, and the kids still got a, a pretty great experience that was interactive. They got to be with their peers in their county, but they were still receiving this national information from our state leaders. So the the summits are are led by those officers. Then, so how did that uh, process go in terms of training them on how to, uh, you know, make an engaging interactive meeting via web conferencing? 
Yeah, the youth are actually so much better than us at knowing what to do uh, to make something fun and interactive because, you know, they're teaching their peers. So they know what it's like to have something that's a long, boring lecture versus something that is interactive and fun. Um, they it, it suggested a game called Kahoot where you can enter in um, questions and they come up on the screen and then anyone with a smart device can log on and play. And um, in a lot of our counties, you know, a lot of them are kind of underserved audiences. And so the youth would have to share smartphones or I'd have to arrange to have, um, you know, some iPads be delivered so that they could be borrowing those to use them for this kind of conference. But it cut the costs way down. The people who attended didn't have to pay at all to, to come to these summits. And we didn't have to bring our um, state leaders because our state officers are spread throughout the state. And so it usually costs us a lot of money to bring even just them down for trainings to get ready for these summits. And we were able to meet over Zoom several times um, prior to each one of these summits to run through our practice and to make sure that it was interactive and fun for them. So what made you kind of think of web conferencing or Zoom uh, as a way to do this? Uh, you mentioned the cost savings, but as you're starting to think about uh, maybe technological solutions to that. Did Zoom kind of come up right away, or were there other considerations? Yeah, we've had um, we've tried a, a few different platforms, and um, they've all been really pretty successful. Zoom works best for us right now, and um, we've really been enjoying that. The um, we meet via Zoom for other planning for other activities. So um, even the state conferences that we'll have with our youth leaders, we like to let them have a huge part in planning those. And so we meet via Zoom probably once a month throughout the year with our with our team leaders. And then as we get closer to each event, we're meeting, you know, a couple times a week to get things ready to go. And we thought, you know, this is really convenient for everybody, youth included. They can go to school, they can, you know, have their extracurricular activities and not have to sacrifice time to participate in 4-H. And it's usable for everyone, you know, everyone has, you know, a phone or access to a phone or an iPad or a computer, even if it's in their county extension office. So it's it's really user friendly for everyone involved. When you guys started to talk about doing it this way, were there concerns um, either because of the youth leadership of it or the technology? What were the concerns that came up? Yeah, big time. Um, we were concerned about the technology. We we're concerned about reaching um, some of our counties have you know, spotty internet service because of their uh, rural areas. And so we were concerned about that. We did a few test runs beforehand to make sure that it would work. The county offices are usually uh, pretty solid, you know, and so we knew that would work okay. We were also really concerned about taking away from the um, interactive aspect of it. And there was a little bit of that, you know, it's not quite the same as being in person, but um, we were able to reach so many more people using this method that it was worth just that little bit of sacrifice to be able to reach so many more people. In the counties, do the kids need to come to the county office? Could they access it from their home? Yeah, they absolutely can access it from their home. And um, we encourage that too. We wanted to bring people to the county office for this first round, especially because it's something new kind of in our program for the youth. Um, as far as training goes and so are these summits and so um, we like I said we hosted workshops that were um, we inc we included workshop meals at, at the county offices that were delivered to drink to bring kind of a draw so that people could see that you know this is a fun interactive thing that you can be playing from home in the future so so um, maybe you can what were the summits really to accomplish? Was it to, just to share information? You've mentioned a lot about the interactive game. Was that a way of teaching the concepts that the leaders uh, picked up at, at the national conference? Yeah, so the leaders all gave, um, they each took turns and they gave a little um, speech about their mission mandate. So about healthy living and what people can be doing in their counties and what they can be teaching to their clubs um, to, to create more opportunities for healthy living and 4-H activities. And then they played a game that quizzed them on their knowledge of healthy living and they talk about the answers. Um, and so we did that for each of the mission mandates and then and leadership as well. And um, and 
so yeah, it was that was the best way for us to get information across from the national level. You mentioned looking at some other tools. Do you think is this Zoom just sort of works the best for what uh, you're trying to do, or is there something about that particular platform that um, how do I put this? Would this be possible in another platform? I guess maybe is a better question. Um, it definitely would. It just depends on your group size and what you're trying to do. So, um, for us, it's nice because we can do a screen share and then it can host as many people as we need. And, um, it's really user friendly. We've used, um, other programs like we've used connect, we've used Google hangouts, we've used, you know, Skype, we've used a bunch of other programs. Uh, right now, Zoom seems to be the most interactive. Um, you can take remote control of someone's screen if they're having a hard time setting up, um, things like that, that we've really enjoyed so far on Zoom. It's been great. So did any problems come up? Like what are the challenges as you've been doing this, um, as they, the summits actually happened? Um, yeah, it was a new concept for people. So you know, people didn't quite understand what we were doing. You know, it's different from any other 4-H activity that we've done in the past where it's in person, you know, we have the same sort of routine where you get a camp t-shirt and you get swag and you do all these things. And um, so at first it was a little difficult. The kids, you know, cl jumped right on. As soon as they understood what was going on, they were signing up with their smartphones and not having any problem interacting. Um, we had, you know, when you're doing it for a large group, we have to set up a projector so everyone can see and that kind of thing. And so we ran into just a couple technical bumps, but it really wasn't bad. Um, for one, for one of them, we had a county that uh, had to log on late. And so we found that that was a little bit of a problem for them because they can't really just jump in in the middle of the meeting like they maybe could have in person. But it was easy enough to host that we ended up just saying, you know, wait, wait an hour or two and we'll just jump on right after and do another one. So they're so easy to host that they have their advantages that really seem to outweigh some of the technical difficulties that you run into. How do you see this web conferencing or maybe other technologies that you've investigated? Um, do you see it being used in other ways, either within 4-H or extension in general? Yeah, absolutely. I think that, um, you know, our challenge is always providing that hands-on experience. And that's something that's um, really important to us. I think that's what keeps us relevant is being able to provide those hands-on learning opportunities. And I think that we need to continue to do that as much as possible. But I do think this is a tool that we can use to enhance those. So, um, you know, in the future, I see us sending out kits to counties so that they can be participating and having us teach uh you know, a lesson based on the kit they have, because it's it's almost like having us there. Um, and like I said, it, it really reaches a wider audience. And I think that's what, that's another challenge that we face all the time is trying to reach new people and, you know, expand that umbrella to try to reach as many people as we can. And at these summits, um, you know, we noticed a lot of people that hadn't been attending our other events that we have. And, and I think a lot of that is a distance or a cost related problem and this really kind of crosses those borders. So I think it's a great tool that we can be using in the future, definitely. I think we'll continue to do this for the officer program at least. Um, and I'd, I'd really like it to make to make this a regular program so that people can understand, you know, every third Thursday or whatever of the month, you can sign on and have a lesson from our 4-H leaders. Cool. Um, one other thing that you've, that uh, you've been active in sort of something new and innovative, I think, is, you know, I came across your YouTube videos, um, uh, and we'll share the link in the show notes for anybody who wants to, to check those out, but um, you've done some sort of recorded video, I guess we call them trainings or learning opportunities for, for folks, and you use sort of a whiteboard sketch method to do that. Um, was that something that, um, how'd you come to d decide to do those videos in that way? Um, so I've seen those before, you know, I've seen whiteboard videos before and there's a couple programs out there that will actually do it for you if you want to put a script in and, you know, do a voiceover. To me, it's not as as uh, intriguing or as interactive as someone who's live. It almost feels like you're more there with them working on it. And so that's why I decided to do it 
with myself drawing. I am not an artist and I know it, um, but it was a great way to reach a lot of people with the same message. And um, in 4-H, we have those those same messages that we want to every one of our chaperones or every one of our employees, for example. And so um, to create something that someone can watch any time of the day or night and um, we can send out before an event that says, okay, if you're going to chaperone this, watch these three things before our chaperone meeting, um, it, it really was a great way to reach people. We've been expanding that a little bit into more um, project specific. So we have a portfolio program and a lot of people call and ask us a million questions about portfolios. And we've put together these training videos and I'm hoping that that will help people get, you know, a more basic understanding of each section of the portfolio and what to um, understand. So those have been a pretty good hit for us in our office as far as, um, you know, getting the same message to a lot of people. How'd you go about learning how to do it? Like the process? Um, you know, I, I've just kind of played around on iMovie a bunch. And so, um, it's really kind of it looks ridiculous when I do one of them because in my office, I'll set up an, uh, an easel or something that I can tape a camera to. And I literally use like painter's tape or masking tape. I tape up a video camera and I draw one out and, and, it's, it takes me probably an hour and a half to do the drawing and then another probably hour, maybe two hours if it's a long video to do the voiceover and editing and then it's done. And, you know, for that amount of time, it's, it's amazing how many views it's had, you know, the, our videos have had, it's like, it's not the, it's not like a huge, you know, hit by any means, but we've hit, we've reached a lot of people um with the same message that didn't take too long to construct so did you so do you have to plan them out in some way sort of know i mean you must know what you're going to draw and have some kind of uh outline in place before you start yeah i do and and um i've done this with a couple other people too so um when i did the first couple i thought okay you know what's coming next and how what can i draw that somehow matches the words I'm trying to say. And there's a ton of mess ups, you know, of course, what you don't see is how many times I erase that and start over because it just doesn't make any sense. And so um, that's what's nice too about the red and wipe off is it's like, well, if it doesn't make sense, you erase it and you just cut it out of the video. And so the editing makes it really easy to just, um, you know, think as you go and look, I have a, a script that I look at and I just draw based off of what the script is reading. So, yep. uh, so, I mean, as we've talked about a few things, you know, you're definitely, I mean, that's why I asked you on working differently in extension podcast, because you seem to be embracing some different ways of working and, and being very innovative. Do you think that is something that sort of comes from uh, just you personally wanting to explore new ways of doing things, uh, you know, culturally within your organization? Is it pushed or, or why have you sort of why do you think you've you've been able to uh, sort of explore these new ways where maybe some professionals uh, might hesitate? Um, I think it's a combination. I think um, if, you know, this office has been really encouraging from day one to me that if there's a better way of doing something, then do it. Um, they're, they accept failure, you know, they, they are like, you know, if you mess up, that's okay. That you're, at least you're trying. And so, um, I've learned to kind of embrace that and and just go with it. If you know you have to think from a kid's mind, okay, what do people want to see? Or I think of myself in a volunteer role, what would I want to do? And and would I rather read a a booklet that's forty five pages long, or would I rather watch a three minute video? It's like no, I'd way rather watch a three minute video. And so I I think that it's um, a lot of the culture in this office. I've been really fortunate to have people surrounding me that have been super supportive and. And we do the same for others in our office. It's it's encouraged to go ahead and, and look for something that works better and try something new. Well, Kelsey, I want to thank you so much for joining us on today's Working Differently in Extension podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Kelsey Romney is a uh, program coordinator with Utah State University 4-H Youth 
programs and she's been doing work with web conferencing and, and making videos and uh, make sure you check out the show notes. We'll have links to uh, some of uh, Kelsey's videos on there as well. Some more information about what she's up to. You've been listening to the Working Differently and Extension podcast. Thanks so much for joining us. A couple of reminders. Hit us up on Twitter. It's at WDNEXT. Uh, also, you can find us on SoundCloud, soundcloud.com slash working differently. And those show notes that I've been mentioning are at bobbirch.com. Thanks again for joining us. Have a great day.